From We First and Goal 17 Media, welcome to Lead with We. I'm Simon Mannering, and each week I speak with top business leaders and founders about the revolutionary mindsets and methods they use to build their bottom line and a better future for all of us by leading with we. Today, my guest is Jeff Dunn, the CEO of Bolt House Farms, which started as a small family farm in 1915 and has since expanded over time into packaged foods, distribution, and a leader of the regenerative food movement. This is actually Jeff's second time as CEO of Bolt House, and he's doing some really exciting things at the company related to plant-based innovation and sustainability. So Jeff, thanks for being here, and I'm excited to chat about what's going on at Bolt House Farms. Great to be here, Simon. Thanks for having me. Now, Jeff, you've had 30 years of experience in the sort of packaged food agriculture space. Give us a bit of a sense of your journey through that time so people get to know you better. Yeah, so my career's really been food and beverage uh, the whole time. First half of my career, uh, it's 30 or 40 years now, it's hard to keep track, but the first half was really Coca-Cola. So I grew right. up in the Coca-Cola system, worked all over the world. You know, my last job there was running the Americas, North and South America for them as, as president, but left Coke. And so the second half of my career has really been uh, private equity and running food businesses, all kinds of different food businesses, the biggest of which uh, is, is Bolt House Farms in terms of its importance to me, not the largest business, but, but the, the most kind of defining for me in terms of my career. And that's been a journey of private equity ownership, selling to the Campbell Soup Company, running it for them for a couple of years and then leaving. And then they decided to sell the business uh, after three years because they had problems with it and changed corporate strategies. Sure. And I made the decision to come back and, and buy it back. And that's, uh, that's a bit of where we are now. We're about 20 months into this next chapter of, uh, of me and Bolt House Farms. I want to dive into that in a second. But you said something really important there, which is, you know, Bolt House is sort of, it may not be the largest brand that you've worked on, but the most meaningful to you. Why, why, why is that? What does that mean? Well, Bolt House is special in that, you know, look, we, we grew up as a farming business. We grow carrots. I mean, we're one of the sure. larger grow, uh, carrot grower processors in the world. And then on top of that business, we built a consumer products business. But it's that linkage to the farm, linkage to where sure. food really comes from. You know, it doesn't come from a distribution center or factory. I thought it, it just from, came from a, sh no, a shelf in yeah. the shopping aisle, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You actually got to go out and grow it, which has been, you know, I didn't grow up a farmer. You know, it's been this latter part of my career where I've, I've learned really deeply about it and learned to appreciate that not only where our food comes from, but the importance of how it's grown, how the people who grow it are treated, and ultimately what that food does for us in terms of our long-term health and the health of the planet. So it's, it's much more important than just a brand to me. It's really about people's health. Yeah, I mean, the power of food is only starting to be appreciated at scale. Those who are chefs and farmers seem to have known this intuitively all along. But, you know, I, I also hear in what you've shared that you know, you build and nurture this really meaningful brand. And then like in many other situations, it's acquired by a larger entity, as in the case with Campbell's here. And I think every entrepreneur, every business leader listening to us would go, oh, wow, what is that like? Because, you know, is the integrity of the company protected and kept safe when you do a deal like that? Or does it actually get compromised? So to help us understand why it wasn't necessarily the right fit and why you came back and swooped in and grabbed it back. Yeah, well, that's a uh, it, it's a great question, and it's it's really about culture at the end of the day. If, if you think about most entrepreneurial companies, they grow up, they're growth companies. There's an energy to them, right. and obviously, they have a product focus. You know, we were fresh food; we were a, a sure. farming business. You know, very different than shelf stable food. And Campbell's strategy was they wanted to move because they saw the consumer moving into better for you brands and healthier food and a lot of fresh food. So that was a very clear strategy. It was understandable. But their culture was a culture really built around shelf-stable, long kind of life food. Of course. And manufacturing and distributing that kind of food. And ultimately, the relationship of that food to the consumer is very different. So right. when we were bought, we stayed a kind of a standalone business unit while I was running it, reporting to the chairman and CEO of, of Campbell's. And that worked really well because we didn't kind of integrate it. We were remained uh, the integrity, the boundaries like and, remained there. Like Ben and Jerry's with, you know, Unilever or seventh generation, right? You kind yes. Of, yeah. 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 It was kind of, you know, and so 
And so, in fact, their CEO, Denise Morrison, was very clear that she told the corporate folks to kind of leave us alone and let us do our own thing. Right. And, and, and that, that really worked. And then I left, and, and for a lot of reasons, uh, they decided to integrate the business. And okay. in that integration, and that means function to function, and, you know, anyone who's uh, been bought by a larger company uh, feels that um, when you integrate, the, the kind of matrix, right? So you're not really running the whole business anymore because pieces of it are being integrated, integrated into the bigger, bigger piece. Sure. And, and, and the result of that was decisions were uh, slowed down. And in a fresh business, because it's not a long life product, decisions have to be made very quickly. And that slowing down of decision making really negatively affected the business. Okay. And they just couldn't pull it out of the tailspin because that's what they knew. It is evidence, you know, we're all a function of our culture and where we grow up. And so if you're used to being a certain way, you're just going to be that way. You know, you know, yeah. the, the smaller entity is always going to have to adjust to the larger one. You get subsumed it, into it. Yeah. And yeah. when that happened, performance of the business, you know, and then the people left. So there was a real exodus of the people who'd really built the business with me. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You feel the culture clash. And then what are those signs when things are not working? Not a sales growth. You lose key people. You lose mind share. Competitors take over market share. Can I ask you a cheeky question? You know, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster ride. Anyone who thinks it's up and to the right all the time is just deluded <laughs> unless they're 22 and they're a billionaire. Do you know what I mean? Do you look back at that chapter in the history of Bolt House? Do you look at it and go, okay, that was a mistake? Or do you go, oh, that was a great learning kind of experience? I mean, how do you think of that, that chapter? I, I think the best way to, to orient it is, is like um, a, a, a around a story, you know, because when, when we, Campbell's bought the business, Denise uh, is an incredible person. I have great respect for her, the, the CEO of Campbell's who bought the business. And she understood this problem. She understood right. before she bought us. And we had right. a long conversation before she bought us about all of this. And, and, you know, we kind of aligned on a way of being and, you know, that really worked for a while. And she and I probably, I wouldn't call it a mistake. I would call it a learning. Even the CEO and the head of a business unit who want to do things a certain way, yeah. the culture is stronger than any individual. The culture sure. all Even the leadership, even the leadership. Even, even CEOs, you know, this is just a reality. And I think the learning for it, I don't want to call it a mistake, yeah. But the learning was really, unless you were willing to take on the culture to make that kind of marriage work, I think it was a bad marriage because yeah. it, we were never going to be able to operate uh, like the way every other division at Campbell's operated because it was a different business. It just at least you got the honeymoon. Case. You got the honeymoon like any marriage. <laughs> Honeymoons are always great. It can go down south straight after that, but that honeymoon is awesome. So, Jeff, on the strength of that learning, why did you come back in and, and sort of take back ownership of, of, of Bolt House Farms? Well, as, as I thought about the business, um, look, it, it was in this distress period, you know, sure. it, it clearly downward momentum. But the fundamentals of the business were still there. Look, people were going to eat carrots. You know, I thought our brand was still relevant to people. And most importantly, the people who still worked at, at, at Bolt House, and, and look, we have many uh, grower, farmer partners, customers, others, I had more people call me in the process when we were trying to buy it back, begging me. They were like, please, Jeff, win, because not that I was the only person who could fix it, but speed in a turnaround is the single most important thing. I was the person who could bring together the team that could probably move more quickly than anyone else to put the f uh, business back on its feet. Yep. So it was really about those people, you know, that were affected, the stakeholders, they needed somebody to come in and kind of put their arms around it very quickly. And, you know, I did it ultimately because I felt like those people deserved it first and foremost. But then I also knew that we had a platform we could take into plant-based food that was very powerful. Sure. And it was sure. really about fix it and transform it. And that's what we're in the process of doing. I, I get a strong sense that you love a challenge like that. But I also know... If that, you know, one of the things that you believe in, Jeff, is like launch first and perfect later. So kind of you, when you talked about speed before and the integration with Campbell's, you know, it's interesting that this thing comes up, you know, consistently with you. Talk to us about the role of speed and then, 
you know, how you then went about retooling Bolt House when you took it back over? Yeah, so um, speed to effective decision is a metric I have. So I think about, uh, you know, how quickly you can put together the right fact base to make a decision. And then you want to make that decision as quickly as possible because particularly it's a market-facing decision. What you want is feedback from the market. This really comes out of technology and lean startup thinking. And so called MVP, right? Minimal viable product. Put it out. Let the consumer respond to it and then constantly improve it. Complete, diametrically opposed to how traditional consumer products companies built products. Right, right. They want to they want to study, 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 test, 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 test. So you're bringing almost it. like a tech mindset to the consumer product category. Uh, and and you know the technology is there now to do it. You know, right. fast prototyping, like we could we could go on, but the technology is there to do it. So it's a mindset. So you have to take, look, farming is a long kind of term business, right? CPG has been this very disciplined business about how you do things. And that technology comes in and disrupts both. Right. So we're a company, we're actually embracing that disruption. And it, it, it is actually all the way from how we bought the business back, the capital structure, how I put the partnership and the ownership together, how I brought the management team together. It was all built around this philosophy of bringing this tech thinking into food and particularly food linked to agriculture because the next 10 years, the revolution that's coming in this space is almost beyond comprehension. It, so it so, could, couldn't be a more exciting space to be in. No, it's so critical. And, you know, there's tension at the heart of what you just shared there that I want to unpack for everyone, which is, you know, as a purposeful company, instead of short termism, you look at longer horizons. You know, you're not looking to just the next quarterly earnings call or, you know, the, the balance sheet alone. At the same time, the CPG world is all about sort of, you know, putting systems in place that don't change. Yet you're bringing a tech mindset to it, which gives you, di- you know, a responsiveness to the marketplace and a dynamism, which is interesting. So you as a CEO, with all of this experience, for us as purpose leaders listening to you, what are the priorities in your head? Like when you talk about that capital structure and everything, what literally goes through? What's the priorities, the filter you use? Uh, the first one is purpose. Why are we here? What are we doing? What are we trying to accomplish, really? I, I presume we're trying to make more money and grow and do all that. Okay, great. Duh. Right. <laughs> you know. So when we talk about purpose, and, and uh, uh, you know, um, we have a very simple statement: plants powering people. Right. So when you unplack our purpose, plants powering people is not only our guiding light, which is really ultimately about creating a plant-based food economy, but people need to understand that. The relationship between people and plants is critical to our long-term health and the health of the planet. It does not to say you can't eat meat or, you know, I'm a flexitarian. But what I do believe is when you understand that plants are the secret to unlocking both sustainable nutrition, sustainable health, and environmental reclamation, that if we start thinking about this purpose through creating a plant-based food economy, it changes everything. And so it's so big that it's very easy for me, at least, to think about how the company aligns to help being part of that, that transformation. And that's, and that's so powerful, Jeff, because a lot of us, you know, if you're a consumer, you think, wow, I hear in the news every day about the climate emergency and how agricultural land is suffering and so on. What can I do? But you, what you're saying is by the simplest purchases you make, you can unlock kind of the connective tissue between health between sort of the health of the living systems out there, and we can start to address these issues simply by voting with our dollars every day in terms of what we buy, right? It, it's the single most powerful thing uh, consumers can do. And, and when people feel disenfranchised and people feel unempowered and people feel like the institutions have let us down, change your behavior. Right. You know, buy different things, vote for different people. You have exactly. power. You yeah. have more power than you know. And the one thing I know about business that I love is a business does respond to its marketplace. It has to, right? It, it has to. Or, you know, there's yeah. a immediate feedback loop called, you know, and if you see the underlying data, the fastest growing part of the food sector today is plant-based. And if you cut across categories, it is unequivocal. And it's, you know, it's small brands and large brands. It's large brands, you know, kind of trying to remodel themselves it's new emergent, you know, entrepreneurial brands creating whole new structures. And there's so much in the pipe relative to new technologies that will create new plant-based products that don't even exist today. And so 10 years from now, food won't look like food looks like now. 
it's going to look completely different. And a whole new group of entrepreneurs are going to create this new food ecosystem. Why? Because this next generation understands this problem deeply and would like not only to be healthy, but they don't trust the institutions to fix it. And they'd also like to have a, the prospect of a healthy future for themselves and their kids and, and so and, on. And their kids. And yeah, millennials with kids. This is deep, deep, deep. You know, this we've done deep. the research. It's really clear. And, you know, what you pointed to there is something that is really important that often get overlook, overlooked as something as wonkish or academic, which is this idea of, you know, participatory multi-stakeholder capitalism, which is how do we practice business in a way where everyone recognizes that they have agency for change. They can actually drive change. So it's not just the CEO of the top of a company. It's not just the politician. It's the supplier. It's the employee. And it's the retailer. And it's the consumer. And it's not just your effort alone, but the combination of all those efforts that are going to allow us to meet these challenges, which are quite daunting, but that's what's going to allow us to get there. Um, so, you know, how do you tell a story like this in a competitive category like yours? You know, so many brands are talking about their purpose. To some, the conversation we're having now is quite elevated. At the end of the day, someone's either standing in a shopping aisle pre-COVID or ordering online and they just want to get what they need for their kitchen table. How do you weave in this purpose story to the sort of product marketing that you're doing? Yeah, the way I would think about that before talking about how we weave it into our product marketing is to talk about the second piece. Because when we talk about plants powering people as kind of our purpose statement, sure, we have kind of a culture statement, which is people powering purpose. <laughs> right. Right. So the, the second screen we put everything we're doing through it is our people, the people who work for us and with us directly, kind of the community and the communities in which we operate. So the best example I can give you of that is when COVID hit, we re-engineered our whole company against two basic objectives. First, the health and safety of our employees and their families. And the second is business continuity. Sure. We said that it's going to cost us a lot of money to do that. It is not in our business plan to spend $25 million on health and safety. Yep. But we cannot look at our employees or ultimately our other stakeholders if we have not taken care of first our employees and our community first. So I believe that marketing and communications comes from uh, only an authentic place if it's going to work, which says you better be walking the talk. You better be integrous in how you approach first and foremost your own people. Because no consumer is going to believe that you're trying to help them if you're doing that on the backs of your employees. That's, that's so true. I mean, you know, the participatory capitalism I was, I was pointing to is both carrot and stick. Forgive me, I couldn't resist that. But carrot and stick in the sense that, you know, they will work with you and reward you, but they're also punitive. Like you've seen employees call out companies everywhere from Facebook to Google to Amazon and so on. But it's, what's really interesting to me is, I don't even know if you're conscious of it, but... At every point, you keep uh, pointing back to looking after the people involved in your business, whether it was bringing, you know, bringing the company back from, from Campbell's or whether it's getting them through COVID or whether it's the culture you build. You know, I think one of the things I've always taken away from marketing is that you're not in the shoe business, you're not in the packaged goods business or whatever, you are in the people business. And the things you make are the different tools of your trade through which you affect change, improve lives, and so on. But if you ever lose sight of the importance of people, then you fail to recognize what business you're in. This is so kind of intuitive to you, but can you speak to that for a second? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a word for it, hum, human-centered design. Right. You know, I mean, human-centered design is kind of how we design products. We're designing around how people use them, how they live their lives, how we want our products to fit into the reality of, of people's lives, both functionally and, and emotionally and psychologically. But as a marketer, as a brand person, and as a leader, and probably mostly as a leader, if you're not kind of always working on your empathy, really understanding your audience, your uh, communities, and understanding that's not about you, we've had pretty dramatic view of different kinds of leadership in this country over the last sure. five, five years. And I, I believe that what people deeply are um, magnetized to and hungry for is this thing we call it authenticity. I'm not in love with that word, but I think it's really integrity. Yeah. You don't have to agree with me about everything, but if I'm clear about what my values are, what my brand stands for, and I walk that talk, you can decide if you want to be part of my gang, want to hang out. 
Yeah. The idea is, that I'm going to manipulate you into it, it's the difference between manipulative and magnetic energy. I can try right. to manipulate you into liking me, or I can just be who I am and you'll like me if you like me. I, I think that's so powerful what you're saying. I mean, I look at it and go, what is going on? Is something new going on right now with purpose and why did it show up now? But I think about it slightly differently, Jeff, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think, you know, since the 50s, 60s, 70s in the last century, you know, we became very enamored with the power of media. We got drunk on the power of media to tell people what to think, do or buy. Levi's are cool. Buy Levi's. And we got very disingenuous. We were manipulating people. But then the web and social media and digital came along and our access to the web allowed us to find out information for ourselves and push back. And so the last several decades, whether you call it CSR and philanthropy or whether it's sustainability and now purpose, is really just peeling back the disingenuous layers that we built on top of the original integrity of business. And our employees, our suppliers, our customers, our consumers are just calling BS on it all day long. So I don't think that we're doing anything new right now. I just think the things that weren't helpful, that weren't authentic, as you say, are getting exposed and are getting walked back. Would, would you agree? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's almost, it's almost uh, cyclical, though, because a new medium arises you know, at first, you know, I think it's open and, you know, you can you can do a lot with it and then, you know, just take influencers. Now, influencers aren't, it's not real. They're not you know, what they used to be, right? Not, I don't know. They used to, I mean, when they started, they were. They were just people out being authentic and doing what they're doing. Now it's manufactured, right? And everybody knows that. And it's pay to play and all that. So, right. Yeah. So what what's the next influencer? Like, see, I think you're stripping away all the way back to stop trying to be an influencer in that sense and right. tell people what you believe. Your comms are about amplifying your beliefs and your actions in a way that people can assess you and evaluate you and hold you accountable to what you're saying relative to the functionality and the productivity of your product, relative to your claims about ESG or other things you're doing in society, and ultimately how you're treating you know, everyone. See, I, I don't think you can treat your employees bad and then treat your consumers good and say you're a good company. Sure. I just don't believe it. And, and most people would agree with that. Like, I think most people like the center is like, just wants a fundamental, ethical, moral, integrist, just like good old American, just keep your word. And so I really believe that COVID is driving a bifurcation, that the companies that stand on that kind of values-based ground are going to be really rewarded. And the I, companies or greenwashing are going to have a lot of problems. They are. I agree. And I think it is a, a watershed moment. And I think, you know, what you're really telling our listeners and those watching is that it's actually good news. It's not something clever. There's no silver bullet you're looking for. Just do it for real. Just literally <laughs> give a damn, do it right. And then let everything that you make, the way you treat your employees, how you go to market, how you give back, let them be data points that are social proof of kind of the integrity of, of your intent. And let me ask you, you mentioned a couple of words a moment ago that I think, are, you know, are self-evident, but it's hard when you're a leader or the founder of a, a new company, which is, you know, to really prioritize empathy and authenticity at a time when you're looking at a balance sheet and are, are you moving enough product and so on. In your very experienced leadership mind, how do you calibrate the two? Are they one and the same thing? Do you prioritize them according to the particular situation? Because, you know, leading with empathy is such a sort of a soft skill, a, a soft mindset in the best sense. And there's so much rigor and there's so much pressure on every new business today. So what advice would you give us? Um, empathy is a real interesting thing. So I'll tell you, sorry, we're doing a leadership exercise with our top 50 folks in the company very diverse group of people. I felt like coming out of COVID, we as a group needed to take a step back and kind of share our learnings over the last year because we were all thrust into wartime conditions on sure. every, every aspect of the business. And so we brought them together and I asked them what their learnings were, biggest things that they learned, biggest gaps they found in their own leadership, things that just surprised them. Mm -hmm. And we broke it into three or four themes the number one theme that came out, and this was what they told us, was the, them learning to be more empathetic. Interesting. Be, because the stresses, and I think what happened is, 
One of our managers said, look, early in COVID, as a very senior person runs all of our operations, it became clear to him, Zach's his name, that our people couldn't get food when the grocery stores early in March, but just about a year ago. And they, they were literally couldn't get to the grocery store to get food because the grocery stores were crazy. Right. And, and we were worried about having food. So he said, I, I think I got these guys, they got a bunch of frozen meals. We can buy truckloads and we'll just give them to our people. And I was just like, do it. Right. Like, like that, that to me is being empathetic. That's actually feeling what your employees are feeling like when they're not at work. They got other issues. They have their lives or human yeah. beings. What can we do to support them? And that was just a little thing, but it was a little thing that was based on him feeling their pain, feeling their yeah. stress, feeling. Yeah. And if you want to be a great consumer marketer, ultimately great consumer marketers find some unmet consumer need and they really do a good job of building a product that fits it or a service or an experience. And then, and then, you know, they're ahead of everybody else, whether that yeah. was Google search or, you know, they, they found something that people really needed. So. For us, I don't think there's a trade-off on empathy in the bottom line. I think the only way to build a strong bottom line over time is actually to build empathetic leadership in your whole organization. Because right. if you can't feel what's going on in the market, you know, the data is important, but analytics can only take you so far, particularly I, as a consumer-oriented business. What you're sharing is so important for us all because as leaders in whatever capacity, we've got to kind of force rank these priorities in our head. And if I hear you correctly, you know, your guiding principle is your purpose. But then quickly below that are the values that you elevate, like empathy and so on. But with that as a kind of container or context, you've got to be dynamic and respond to the marketplace and really serve those needs in, in real time. Would that be fair? Yeah, and drive performance. Look, I'm a very performance-driven leader. But I look at performance and then look at what will drive better. You know, we can drive analytics against performance all day. I, I'm a I'm a baseball fan and I love the Dodgers and because I, I love the way they constantly analyze and engage their players in the analytics. Right. So, but the analytics are not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is how they engage the players in talking about the analytics. Right. Right. Because if they don't accept them, if they don't internalize them, if they don't view them as productive, then they get defensive and then you get negative kind of behaviors as opposed to them feeling this is there to make them the best player they can be. We have this conversation with our leaders. I want to make each of them the best leader they can be, the most dynamic leader. And there's no model I'm putting them through. In Coke, we had a long discussion as a leadership team of Coke over how to build the greatest leadership model in history. And then we would just train people into that leadership model. Isn't that I, I interesting? Have, yeah. I've totally thrown that away. You know what? You, you want to destroy leaders? Try to force them into a cookie cutter model. You want right. to build leaders, understand people's uh, essence of who they are. And, and then I, you can build their leadership from there. I think that's so powerful what you just shared, that crisis doesn't make leaders, it reveals leaders. I mean, there are those who just, and it's probably a function of what you talked about with empathy, you know, with those who can see the difficult situations of others and really step into that need. I have to say that one of the, you know, the silver linings of such a tragic time like COVID is that everyone understood that everyone was struggling. So we could drop this pretense that we all have every day, this <laughs> face that we put on when we walk in the office. Everything's great. It's all good. I'm wearing sweatpants under here. So are right? you. We both know we're both wearing sweatpants. And we're all know? just keeping it together. We're just keeping it together. And I think it just humanized everything, you know, and help us understand, you know, how you then throttle to that bottom line, because no amount of good intentions or elevating the right emotions or prioritizing the right things in terms of leadership takes away from the need to really demonstrate whether you've got investors or shareholders, or whatever, how it's translating to the bottom line. So how do you integrate those two? Well, so let's talk about performance for a second. When I took this business over from Campbell's, it was on about a 19% revenue decline. Margins had been shrinking for three years. Um, market share by any measure was, was down dramatically. And so you know, fast forward 20 months, today we're growing about 27% top line. Our bottom line's growing at 2x that rate. We've regained 10 points of market share. Uh, and I invested into that um, by hiring back a lot of people. But we certainly benefited from the COVID bump that happened with people eating from home because we're, we're more of a retail brand, right? But at the heart of it, uh, I think it was as simple as 
these people I brought back understood the nature of our business, like, like the operating realities, right? And I didn't have to, in most turnarounds, you have like the leader with this 100-day punch list. The most amazing thing about this is we knew the areas of the business we wanted to dig into, but we, the first thing we did is brought all these people back and we turned them loose on the problem. Right. See, th this is the secret to making money, particularly $800 million revenue business, not a huge business, but not a small business, but it's a complicated business, deep operating reality. And it's in that middle layer that that's where profitability happens. Right, right. And, you know, do you find that you've had certain learnings during COVID that you want to take forward? I mean, was there an innovation unlock that you were surprised about? The biggest innovation unlock for us has been what we believed hat was going to happen in COVID at the beginning, which was if this thing goes on for a while, fundamentally how people orient to food at home and cooking primarily is going right. to change. Right. Uh, this will be one of the real silver linings around COVID uh, at home. Um, you don't cook for a year and forget it. You've learned a new skill, right. whether you wanted to or not. Sure. That skill is central to uh, kind of a healthy diet because it's very difficult to have a healthy diet if you're not cooking and you can't kind of orient towards fresh food. Right. So we have this wonderful opportunity. We're launching a whole new platform called Wonder Roots, which is really about meal kits with carrots to make things like carrot noodles, carrot rice, carrot hot dogs, all of it really to support the consumer at home in this right. journey, this plant-based diet. And built around that is a lot of fun and really to engage families and, and kids in this because this is all designed, if you understand food, if you understand eat more whole foods, eat more fresh food, eat more plants, just directionally, and we give you affordable, great tasting, available, convenient products, the consumer already wants to go here. I don't have to create this unmet consumer need. It's already there. Right. So for us, the big learning was we can go even faster at engaging the consumer because what we've seen is a material uptick in you know not only people cooking but people interest in these kind of solutions right plant based right. is just going through the roof in terms of people trying to figure out how to get more of it into their diet and let's talk about the plant based movement for a moment firstly you know you're 20 months into this so you look far too rested for a person who's 20 months into a buyback and so on firstly how did you structure the buyback uh, you know, it's, because it's a very unusual, unique situation to take a company back. Yeah. I think I've heard Richard Branson do it in a couple of times and others, but very few. You know, how did you structure that buyback? And then movement is a lofty word. It sounds almost um, beyond the reach of many entrepreneurs, but it's actually very tangible and doable based on what you've already shared. So how did you structure the buyback? And then how do you play into a movement? So, um yeah, you can probably guess Campbell's didn't want to sell the company back to me just because they, they bought it from me. It's just optics aren't that great. Yeah, uh, they're, like, so, they're so, like, Jeff, no, anyone but Jeff. Anyone but Jeff. Anyone? I'm not sure, anyone? I, I, I'm not sure they said that, but but look, I think it would have been evident to anyone and sure. the bankers and everybody, right? So my partners in the deal, I'm, I'm a partner in another private equity fund called Butterfly, which is a new fund, uh, two young very entrepreneurial finance guys launched. And I was an operating partner with before we decided to go after Bolt House. Right. Uh, they're incredible young men because they're trying to build a disruptive PE fund. And one of the reasons I aligned with them is from the beginning, they structured purpose into their fund from the beginning. And Butterfly, naming it Butterfly, nobody names finance funds Butterfly, but it was about transformation, both Absolutely. the companies, the food system. And they only invest in food from, from kind of seed to fork, and they give 10% of what they uh, they make forever into the Butterfly Foundation, which will support food charities. Fantastic. So they're, and they're both in their 30s. They're just, it's one of the reasons I look rested is I have a lot of, you know, young, dynamic people around me who are just killing it. And so th I this, this is their way of being in the world. It's not some idea. This is who yeah, they they're are. Not, yeah. They're not trying to do it. They're doing yeah. it, yeah. you know, and they're, they're incredible. And, and so... I had every private equity fund in the world when Campbell said they were going to sell Bolt House. Call me because I had the keys to the kingdom. I had the people and the knowledge. So that was simple. But I aligned with them, but they didn't have enough money to do the whole deal. We bought the business back for $500 million and $400 million of it was equity right. uh, because the business wasn't performing. We couldn't lever it up and we didn't want to do that anyway. 
So we raised the rest of the money. Uh, they kind of administer it for me in a special purpose vehicle. So we set up an entity, which is called Generis. So my kind of uh, mantra for this acquisition was sui generis, was once in a lifetime. And I actually got a tattoo right here, which I won't show you of a carrot after we close the deal that says sui generis. Because it was once in a lifetime for me to structure an opportunity in a way that I really believed I had control of the structure from the beginning. Because I've already worked for other people, right? I work for a private equity fund or a corporation. And so this was once about kind of from the beginning, making sure that we had the right intention put into this. And I trusted sure. my partners and we did. So that allowed us to structure it with a, you know, a long-term fund because we needed a long-term focus, uh, kind of an ESG focus with our investors because they really believed in what we were doing. A lot of excitement with our investors around plant-based. And the most important thing was that they aligned with me on the vision from the beginning. Yep. So they're, as in, they're kind of invested in uh, plants powering people as I am. So that alignment makes my life very simple because all I'm doing is doing what I told you I was going to do. Isn't that crazy? I mean, people almost see purpose as a nice to have, not a must have. But when you're looking to raise capital, when you're looking to inspire employees, when you're looking to share a story with critical retail partners, it's so fundamental to get an alignment on a human level between people. And I, and I want to ask you, you know, you lured 70 great people back to Bolthouse apart from the Jeff magic. Like, what did you say to them to bring them back? Was it the promise of the company? Was the purpose a big part of that? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And, and I brought people not just who had worked at Bolthouse before, but people who had worked for me at other companies before, including, you know, some venture opportunities we've had. So we brought people from a number of places because I really brought in, for example, uh, Mike Rosenthal is my CFO, but he's also my CIO, my chief innovation officer. He's a Silicon Valley guy. He's not an ag or food guy. You know, his background is really technology. And I brought him in because exactly I wanted that kind of diverse point of view at the table. And he came because he's very committed to building a plant-based food system. Right. It is a driving. And, you know, his story, his wife, uh, now ex-wife, but, but you know, she was diagnosed with cancer. And they saved her. She was, she was stage four cancer. And they completely changed her nutrition. They basically had to go very extreme. And... In that moment, he decided that his life was going to be out understanding nutrition and how it could affect health. And he wanted, and he's a business guy, but so he wasn't a scientist, but he wanted to work in a business that was committed to making substantial change so that other people wouldn't have to go through what he went through with his wife and she obviously had to. And so many people have that same kind of motivation. They look at this not as a, you know, I want to build a big company. They look at it from, I want to build a company that helps this dialogue and helps change the perception of what's possible. And because we farm, you know, it's kind of the root. It's no pun intended, but the carrot yeah. is the root. The root of all of this is I, this is how we're going to solve our problems. There is not another solution with the scope of what food can do. I think you're, you're, you're so right in a kind of not only a remedial sense in that it can course correct, like, you know, for that lady in terms of cancer and really help with the health, but also preventative. Like if we do things the right way in the first place, we won't have these issues to solve for. You know, you have this unique lens, Jeff, on this whole plant-based food movement and economy that you're talking about. And for us who are all, we're hearing about it in different ways, but we don't know where we are on that journey. You know, in terms of where we've got to get to in terms of the industry and the way we go to market and the type of food we're bringing to market, are we making good progress in terms of where we need to get to? Are we really in truth just at the beginning of retooling the industry in the first place? Is consumer sort of expectation rising to meet this opportunity? Like from your perspective, the spectrum between where we are now, where we need to get to, how are we going? I think we're making great progress, to tell you the truth, and, and, and really on two fronts. One is that because of impossible and beyond, there's been a whole new massive infusion of investment into the more entrepreneurial, you know, phase of business, right? So venture growth. And so, and, and not just in brand companies, but in ag and food technology companies, right? More fundamental technology. This uh, massive investment, like I believe, you know, in business, I believe in the power of investment and power of entrepreneurship. 10 years from now, this will be that, you know, those, those tsunamis will be hitting the beach, right? Yeah. There, and, and 
the more success there is, it feeds on itself. And food is its own sector, food and agriculture. And so I think what people are understanding is, wow, I don't want to invest in the consumer, consumer sector. I want to invest into food and agriculture because I see not just the long-term value creation, but more importantly, this vehicle. And look, uh, uh, Bill Gates, one of the biggest far farmland owners in the world now. And, you know, you, you see people who are really committed to climate change actually taking an active role, particularly relative to the use of land, regenerative agriculture, you know, the right kind of grazing, all, all these things. We're learning very quickly on how to start to adjust this and the consumer. Look at what happened with cage free. Right. Look what, you know, look very quickly. Right. So McDonald's had to go to cage free eggs, you know, so the consumer decided and McDonald's moved because they knew because they asked the consumer and they said, I want them. So what's the opportunity like for young entrepreneurs and social enterprises out there? It seems like if you walk down the shopping aisle, there are so many, you know, processed products out there that are begging for reinvention. Like, is it just, you know, a gold rush waiting to happen for entrepreneurs that seize that opportunity? How would you characterize it? Uh, I think the gold rush is thinking in the food system terms, kind of seed genetics all the way through, through um, you know, the fork. And the reason for that is, if people think about food as traditional food, processed food brands, which is where all the kind of value was seen, I don't think they're seeing the big picture. What we need is the next generation of farmers. We need the next generation of food technologists. We need the next generation of agricultural technologists. And look, when you look at certain uh, plants, and so l let me just do a quick one on plant-based. Plant-based has been sure. defined as meat and dairy alternatives. That's not my definition. My definition is you start with the plant and you productize every value of that plant possible. So take mushrooms, for example. Well, there's a unlimited way, unlimited varieties of mushrooms, unlimited ways you could turn mushrooms into alternative products, and then, you know, uh, nutraceuticals and ultimately pharmaceuticals. So if you take, it's, it's plant adjacent, but you take a mushroom and it can go in a hundred different directions. And so if we take the plant up and start thinking about how human's health is related to the plants we eat, right? And how we consume that, what's the bioavailability of those plants? That to me is the secret. Now, whether that manifests as a drink or a meal or a snack or whatever, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what's going to serve kind of the nutritional health. And we have to get to the point where nutrition becomes the primary driver and it will be taste good and be affordable. But it's really about when we got 9 billion people, we better be much more efficient at getting people the nutrition they need. I mean, you know, it, has a, it adds a whole other nuance to what you mean by plants powering people. It really it is plants powering entrepreneurs. I mean, you've got the, the, the endless variety and species of plants out there, but then you've got all these different ways that you can take them to market to unpack all their different benefits. I think, you know, as you say, in the next 10 years, driven by, you know, the impact of climate emergency, growing population, consumer expectations, the, the values-based sort of conscious consumers out there, I mean, there is nothing but opportunity in front of us for those who sort of step into it. So what's your advice either for, you know, legacy brands or existing companies that want to retool or for new companies that want to step, step into this space? As someone who has all the experience you have, how would you begin this process? What is the first thing you need to do? And then, you know, what are the sort of steps two and three? Yeah, I think the first step for any entrepreneur in this space is, is, is really... Um, you know, beyond their own inspiration. I don't think you can, you know, I don't think you can engineer the inspiration. They have to have some inspiration. But how do you get inspiration? So the first thing I do would be to expose yourself to really uh, unknown parts or invisible parts of the food system. And you just do that by asking questions. But if you've never been on a farm, go see one. If you've never seen, you know, a fresh, uh, you know, processing facility, go see one. Because in the experience, it will come the inspiration. You're not going to get it sitting in your room, and and you might you might get it looking at the computer, but that's not what food's about, and that's certainly not what agriculture is about. It's actually about nature. It's about the natural order. So I always say to people, go back to what sparks um, your own imagination, what sparks your own energy, and I, I bring everything back when I talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about energy. Where is your energy drawn? What aspect of the food system is it drawn to? Once you understand that. Then I think you can actually go deep and you can start to say, what is that? What do I see the eminent needs? What am I really trying to do here? And look, I, I talk to entrepreneurs all day long 
in the food space. And what I'm always amazed at is that um, they don't necessarily see what they're doing in the big picture. So, you know, the, the second thing I would tell them to do is build that set of uh, kind of resources, right? Before you even launch a product and not about investors, it's about your own kitchen cabinet of people and reach out. One of the love about young people, I get it all the time. I get more 17 year olds who send me, you know, DMs and stuff, want to know stuff. I think for young people, I encourage them to be very brave and, and don't take no for an answer. And you want to talk to somebody, whether it's Oprah or Jeff Dunn, track them down. Like, you want to be an entrepreneur? Knock on some doors. Right, right. Co <laughs> collect, collect, collect some no's. Collect some you, no's. You know, exactly, because no is the thing. You got to, you, you know, I heard one time from a great entrepreneur, it's like, it's, you know, you got to make people see something that isn't there yet. And then you got to be able to get over all the mountains and hills to get there. And you don't even, it's not there yet. So, it, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is, it's a special kind of thing. But it starts with, you know, look, the drive and obviously the energy. But once you kind of kind of go through those second two screens, I always say to people is break some China. You know, the third thing you want to do is put on your disruptive hat. And I think the best entrepreneurs, look, Elon Musk, you know, look at him. Man, he just breaks things all day long. You know, the Jeff Bezos theory is I win if we do more experiments more often every day than anybody else across the whole business. Right, right. How do you do that? you recruit a lot of people who like to do experiments and who aren't willing to fail. Because if you don't have those people, you won't do the experiments. And so it all comes back. If you want to retool yourself as a company, you have to start with the people you have. Because if the people you have are not culturally aligned with that, trying to change people like that way, what you have to do is find the people who actually are oriented that way and turn them loose. And I think... Uh, and yeah. What I'm taking away from you, Jeff, is so powerful, which is, you know, it's the passion and that lives within you. There's, there's no mystery. There's no silver bullet out there. So fuel that passion and then make some mistakes. Take those risks. Experiment more, which we all wish we could give ourselves permission to do, but we always pull ourselves back or we think we've got to do things the right way. But what you're saying is success is driven by that. And then find those people who care about the same things and unlock their potential and enable their leadership in unique ways. And, you know, the connected tissue between all of that is, is purpose. I mean, that is the emotional glue between people. And I, I always come away from, you know, seeing brands like yours very excited because this is something that's fundamentally human. You know, it's not some intangible business model. It's not some spreadsheet. This is something that's innate within all of us. And I want to say, Jeff, you know, firstly, I want to say thank you for the leadership with, you know, Bolt House Farms and for taking it back and for, you know, propelling it into the future, but also thank you for your support of younger entrepreneurs, because these are big issues we've got to solve for, but it's also an incredibly large marketplace opportunity. And, um, you know, I think the guidance of, you know, leaders like you are really is what's going to enable us to accelerate our response to these challenges. So thank you so much for your time today and for all the insights. And, um, you know, here's to continued success for Bolt House Farms. Awesome, Simon. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Lead With We. You can find out more information about Jeff and Bolt House Farms in the show notes for this episode. Lead With We is produced by Goal 17 Media. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to this channel here on YouTube by clicking the red button below so you never miss an opportunity to learn from our guests and apply their insights to your business. You can also listen to each episode of Lead With We on Apple, Google, or Spotify. I'll see you next week. And until then, let's all lead with we.